Hello and welcome to House Church for August. We're really excited to be doing this again in this way. Um, uh, we are uh, the beginning of a sermon series that we're looking at through August entitled That the World May Know. Um, and what we're looking at there is that the world will know that we're Jesus' disciples if we love one another. Um, and so we're looking at over five weeks different ways that we do that different ways that that works for us um, and this last Sunday we looked at forgiveness forgiveness really is the key to open us into uh, into that life of love if we don't do forgiveness if we if we stay in unforgiveness then we actually exclude ourselves and we end up not loving one another um, in fact if um, if we end up in any level of unforgiveness with anyone um, that permeates through and poisons all of our relationships um, that's what Jesus uh, tells us when he says that we have authority to forgive sins and we have uh, what we bind on earth gets bound in heaven and what we loose on earth gets loose in heaven. This is a really powerful thing um, that the enemy doesn't want us to use, um, but, but Jesus gives us the power of forgiveness to release us into um, relationships of, of reconciliation, of, of love and of abundance. And that's what Jesus does on the cross with us. Um, and that's what he invites us into. So we're going to look a little bit at that today. And the case study we're going to look at in uh, in our, our small groups, our house churches um, for this month. Um, the case study today is Luke 15. Luke 15 is one of my favorite passages in scripture. Um, and, and it, you know, we can look at it in many different ways. But I want to highlight the forgiveness that's displayed here. Uh, it's really interesting that we've got three um, stories or three parables that make up one story. Uh, Jesus, at the beginning of Luke 15, you see that he's having a little bit of a clash with the Pharisees. And the Pharisees are annoyed that he's hanging out with the um, prostitutes and the tax collectors. And indeed, he's having a meal with them or meals regularly with them. Uh, and so in response to people's, um, uh, to the Pharisees particularly, uh, but of course it's written to us as well that we would see this. To people's response who think that um, there's certain ways that God should operate or certain people that he should engage with. Or if certain people do things that they deserve something else, um, then Jesus tells these parables in response. And these parables are a, a picture of the radical love of God um, that he invites us to live out. So what you have is you have the, um, the story of uh, the lost sheep and, uh, um, and you have the lost coin. And um, both of these stories describe um, uh, the pursuit of the owner, um, desperate to, to find the one that's lost. Um, and there's this really interesting phrase that comes in there where it says that um, uh, there is, there's a party in heaven when a sinner repents. And that, that's really interesting because um, uh, there used to be an old Pharisaical saying that said this. It's an old rabbinic saying which said... Um, uh, that there's a party in heaven when a sinner gets obliterated before God. So there's this mindset that people will get their just desserts and there's a party because justice has been served. But actually Jesus totally flips that phrase on its head. Instead of a party being when, when a sinner gets what they deserve, what happens is when, it's when a sinner gets what they don't deserve, which is absolute grace, pursuit of love and reconciliation. And we see that most clearly in the story of the prodigal son, the son goes away and when he returns, you expect that the father is going to be go nuts. That would be the social norm in that case. In fact, anyone in the town would be welcome to throw stones at him. They would legitimately be able to do so by the shame that was brought on by the choices of the younger brother. But what we see with the father is that whether it's because he wants to protect the son in the city or whatever it is that he does, there's some pull, this lure, this desire for reconciliation, this overflow of forgiveness. He doesn't even have to wait for his forgiveness to come. He's desperate to embrace his son. In fact, what he does is he says he pulls up his, his dress to be able to run. He would have had to do that. He wouldn't have been able to run in Middle Eastern clothing. Um, but to pull up your, your dress like that, to hold up one's robes, is actually shame upon the father. He's already been shamed, but he's willing to be shamed again. And he runs out to meet his boy. And then he grasps his boy and he holds him. He doesn't just forgive him. You see, what forgiveness would be, would, he, would be, yes, okay, I understand that you are sorry. And I forgive you and I'll hire you as a hired worker. But that isn't what he does. What he does is he says, let's kill the fattened calf. And let's put a cloak on him and let's give him a ring on his finger. For my son was lost, but now he's found. And he embraces him. 
Unfortunately, the story doesn't finish there. The story goes on and we see ourselves and we see the Pharisees and we see any one of us who struggles to forgive in the older brother. And the older brother doesn't hasn't done any categorical sins, hasn't done anything wrong, has always kept loyal like the 99 sheep or the nine coins. But this brother is annoyed at grace. He's annoyed at the forgiveness and the abundance of love. And by his unforgiveness, the story ends with his exclusion. He hasn't been excluded by the father or the younger son. He's been excluded by himself and by his unforgiveness. And that's a catch for us. If we live in unforgiveness, either with other members of our parish, or with the parish itself, or with, or with other people, or with anybody in our past, we exclude ourselves from the fullness of love, of abundance and joy, of feasting and celebrating in the way of Jesus. So I invite you to be vulnerable with each other tonight, or this afternoon, or this morning, however you're meeting. Be vulnerable with one another, and dare to believe that not only has God forgiven you, but that you can forgive everyone. I'm going to pray. Holy Spirit, I pray you would be in all of our meetings, that we would feel your freedom, step into the life you've given us, and that we would be like you, people of forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen.